Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. And right now on your news at 6, a higher CPS energy rate. What council approved when it's going to start impacting your monthly bill. Plus, thousands of cars stolen every year in Texas because of a simple mistake. How to make sure thieves don't target you as colder weather approaches. And a doctor shares why the pandemic shouldn't be a reason for delaying surgery. What can happen if you go untreated for too long? But first tonight, for many, it may seem much longer, but it's been nearly two years since the pandemic began in March of 2020. Tonight, we have reached a tragic milestone. 5,000 COVID-related deaths in our community. Our Jesse Degollado talking to a man whose wife was the first person locally to die of that illness, an illness that has devastated thousands of families since. Christ is calling a lot of people home. Sadly, Allie Wallace's wife Doris became the first of many, many to come. The 84-year-old, an accomplished seamstress and dress designer, died in March 2020, soon after they were both hospitalized. Her husband of 64 years, later learning they'd come down with COVID-19. They finally used convalescent plasma to get my body under control. At one point, Wallace says he was in a coma for four days. Up until COVID, the Army-trained medic, lab tech, and photographer had been his wife's caregiver after she'd gone blind and later developed dementia. You know, and I tell people I did the best I could with the knowledge that I had to take care of her. Even that was a tremendous blessing. A believer like his wife, Wallace says the last time he saw her alive. I called her name. I said, Doris. And immediately she opened her eyes and looked at me. His faith tells Wallace, despite being blind, his wife saw him, then smiled and closed her eyes, much like when she used to look up at the ceiling. She never would tell me what she saw, but I do believe that she saw angels. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. It is now official. Your CPS energy bill is going up. The San Antonio City Council giving the go ahead today for a two part rate increase through a 3.85% bump in the base rate you pay and a higher fuel charge. And together, they'll cost the average homeowner an extra $5.10 per month. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger is here with what you need to know. All right, Garrett, first off, when will this hit our bills? Well, Steve, this doesn't take effect until March 1st, and it takes a few weeks to implement in the utility system. So customers probably won't actually start seeing it in their bill until the end of March or so. But let's get into the why of this increase. Now, CPS Energy said it needs this to it needed the extra fuel charge to pay down the hundreds of millions of dollars it already had to shell out for the fuel and energy costs during last year's February freeze. And the bump in the base rate is for infrastructure, technology and staffing needs. Though a majority of council members thought this was necessary, no one's expecting this to be happily received, especially since that disastrous freeze was less than a year ago. We asked the utilities interim CEO and president what he wanted to tell you, the bill payers. And again, you know, maybe with some customers who were out three or four days, maybe we'll never win their trust back, but it is not going to be for a lack of effort on my part or our team's part that we're not going to try. So what I tell you is, please just give us a chance, you know, to win back your trust. And we're going to try to do that one day at a time. They're going to need to work pretty quickly on building that trust since the utility is also talking about two more rate increases over the next five years after they went eight years since the previous increase. Now, District 2's Jalen McKee Rodriguez and District 5's Terry Castillo were the only two council members to vote against both parts of the increase. District 10's Clayton Perry joined them in voting against raising the base rate. Uh, Steve, Myra. Thank you, Garrett. A San Antonio police officer on the other side of the law tonight after investigators say he hit a woman in the face. It all happened during an alleged domestic violence dispute. Bear County deputies say the they arrested 28 year old Christian Harris following an assault call just before three this morning. Deputies say Harris tried leaving the scene but was stopped a block away and taken into custody. He's been with SAPD since 2016. He is temporarily suspended without pay, being held on a $2,500 bond. He is scheduled to be arraigned on February 14th. Homicides in San Antonio increasing 23% in 2021 over the year 2020, and most 
were due to gun violence. According to SAPD, there were 160 homicides documented in San Antonio last year. Police Chief William McMahon is saying that three in four were caused by gun violence and most of the killings he described as spontaneous acts of violence. Chief McManus says that SAPD is trying to get those numbers down by doing things like mapping where crime happens most and breaking that down into micro districts to investigate. For every case is assigned, every case is investigated, every lead is followed up until we run out of leads. And then when we run out of leads, we're still not done with it. If another lead comes in a month from now, we're back on it again. But, you know, we don't brush any case aside because it's more serious or less serious than another. He also pointed out that a lack of cooperation from witnesses and surviving victims in some cases complicates investigations. Chief McManus says that more guns are out on the streets and people seem to be quick to use them in tense moments. Two women pulled from a burning vehicle after police say the driver lost control. Take a look at this. This was the scene near Fredericksburg Road and West Hildebrand Avenue just before 3 a.m. Officers tell us the driver apparently lost control, jumped two curbs, crashed into an urgent care parking lot before the vehicle went up in flames. Police successfully rescued the unconscious driver and her passenger. The fire put out by firefighters. Police say both women refused medical treatment at the scene. Let's take a look now at the full COVID-19 numbers for today. Earlier, we told you that Bear County has now surpassed 5,000 COVID-related deaths. Nine new deaths reported just today. That brings the death toll throughout this pandemic now to 5,006 people. 5,781 new COVID cases reported today. The seven-day moving average now stands at 4,841 cases. There are 982 patients hospitalized this evening. 205 people now in ICU and 73 people are on ventilators. Seguin ISD sending out a notice today that all schools and offices will be closed tomorrow. Superintendent Matthew Gutierrez saying the increase of COVID cases, that's the reason they cannot stay open. Despite their best efforts of trying to keep the school open, he says the district hopes that students and staff will take this time to recover and to rest. Schools are expected to resume again Tuesday, January 18th. If you still need to get vaccinated, there are plenty of places you can go. Right now we have this QR code up on our screen that will direct you to a full list of sites. All you have to do, pull out your phone, open up the camera app, point it at the code, then click on the KSAT link that pops up. We also have a QR code that does the same thing, but for drive through testing sites. If you need some extra time to scan this, you can always pause your TV or just head to the coronavirus section of KSAT.com anytime. How about getting tested? If you need to get tested for COVID-19, the Wonderland of the Americas Mall actually doing them for free. Testing opens up tomorrow from 8 in the morning till 6 at night. After that, the site will be open Monday through Friday. Tests are self-administered. Results take about 24 to 48 hours. This is a walk-up only basis. Appointments are not required. In addition to in-person testing, there was a big demand for those kits that you can use at home. But there was a warning tonight about possible fakes, especially if you're shopping online for them. If you've looked, you know that they are not easy to find in a store right now. Scam artists know this. So now federal authorities say that unauthorized and fake testing kits are popping up online. Also, the Better Business Bureau is beginning to get reports of robocallers trying to trick people into going onto a bogus website to buy them. This isn't a time when you should, again, open your wallet up and say, I'm going to open, buy from anybody that has them. So how do you avoid buying a fake at-home test? Well, the FDA has a list of the at-home tests that it has authorized online. We have a link to that on our website. You can also go online and search for complaints about the kits or the company that's selling them and use a credit card for any purchases. That way you can contact your credit card company to dispute any charges if there's a problem. A recent study found that 53% of people surveyed said their bone, bone, joint and muscle issues have worsened since the COVID lockdown. The reason delays in treatment caused by COVID. As Ursula Perry reports, now is the time to get on your surgeon's schedule. Judy McCormick's always been active, but constant hip pain was interfering with her on the go lifestyle. 
um, canceled ski trips and wasn't able to get my leg up over my bike the way I wanted to. She needed a hip replacement and doctors told her the news right in the middle of the COVID pandemic. She decided to go ahead with the procedure, but did take a few precautions. I was very uh, concerned about being vaccinated before. Dr. Richard Berger says Judy was smart not to wait. Delaying hip or knee surgery can worsen your arthritis and it can lead to longer rehab. And researchers are predicting the number of hip replacements will double. The number of knee replacements to increase at least five-fold in the next decade. A study in The Lancet found the U.S. could expect a backlog of more than one million joint and spinal surgeries by mid-2022. Dr. Berger says if you're in pain, don't wait to schedule your surgery. It's probably the safest environment to go into, safer than the grocery store, safer than the gas station. Everyone here has been tested and vaccinated and it's really the safest place you could possibly be. Locally, orthopedic surgeons are saying that they do not have a backlog right now, even though there's a surge in COVID cases in our area. Simply put, one group told me they're keeping up with their patients. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with live cam this evening. We enjoyed a nice warm up. Out this was a very nice day. Yeah. I'm guessing that's why Caskey isn't here in Katie Blake. <laughs> yeah, so well, yep, I, I don't blame him. It's beautiful. Yeah, it was and, a nice day. And I'm happy to be here. Yeah, happy to we're see happy you to have you. Of course we are. <laughs> um, I'm happy to talk about more nice weather coming up tomorrow, especially if you like today. We're going to see another pretty big temperature swing from morning to afternoon. Um, today, we started off at 36. We made it all the way up to 77, thanks to sunshine and some dry air. 82 was the high temperature in Del Rio, 76 U Valley, 79 in Pleasanton, unseasonably warm, but it was nice and comfortable. Great to see some blue skies. Temperatures are already starting to tumble pretty quickly. We're in the upper 60s at the airport, so it will get pretty chilly quickly over the next several hours. By 8 o'clock, we're in the upper 50s. As we get closer to midnight, temperatures will start to drop into the 40s and we'll start you off close to 40 tomorrow morning. Another day to dress in layers. Strong cold front still on tap to arrive early, early in the weekend with some big time wind and fire danger. We'll talk about that and more coming up in the full forecast just in a bit. All right, thanks, Katie. When temperatures drop, car thefts can heat up. The simple steps that you can take to protect your vehicle and why alarm companies are seeing an increase in business. Welcome back. We want you to stay with us because there's so much coming up tonight on the night beat. Finally, a resolution for the San Antonio man who bought a home but couldn't do anything to it because the city claimed that it was historic. Now, that man wound up taking his complaint to city council and you're going to see what happened. Plus, it's official now. Your energy bill is going to go up after the city council approved a rate hike. And we're going to break down what that means for your pocketbook. That's tonight. We're going to discuss that and so much more on the Night Beat. Thanks, Stephanie. Well, with colder weather expected this weekend, you might be tempted to warm up the car before getting in and taking off. Yeah, Samuel King joins us now. Sam, that can be tempting for thieves. Definitely. Steve and Meyer, AAA Texas and the National Insurance Crime Bureau estimate there were more than 80,000 vehicles stolen in 2018 after being left unattended with keys or fobs inside. Has maybe started Joshua Zuber with AAA Texas says even leaving your car for a moment can really make you a target. Matter of seconds, a thief can jump in your vehicle and take off with uh, stolen property. Experts say these type of thefts spike in the winter months because so many people still start their vehicles to warm them up, but that's simply not necessary. You only need to warm up the vehicle for as long as it takes to buckle your seatbelt then you can get on your way. And then also really uh, um, driving a car at normal, uh, you know, speeds, you know, not not accelerating hard or anything like that uh, really actually will uh, warm the engine up faster. AAA Texas also advises getting an anti theft system if your car doesn't already have one. Uh, it's a two way paging system, so it will page you up to a quarter mile away. The folks at Mother's Window Tent say they've seen an increase in people coming to upgrade or install alarms, particularly owners of older Ford pickups in response to more stolen vehicles. 
you know, most people think, oh, I don't need one, I don't need one, and then it happens, and they, they see that it, it does help. They say alarms may not completely prevent thefts, but they are a strong deterrent. Remote start systems that allow the vehicle to remain locked uh, while the ignition is engaged can also be an option for vehicle owners, but just keep an eye on the vehicle, of course. As for this evening's traffic, some issues, Loop 410 uh, westbound, but here in the past uh, two minutes, literally or so, a crash just cleared, but you can see a uh, wide view of uh, traffic there. So that caused some uh, major slowdowns here on Loop 410 on the northwest side, 12 minutes um, once you got past I-10. Major delays, 281 to I-10. Uh, still watching things, but this uh, looks like some good news. Uh, Loop 1604 was closed at Highway 90 uh, because of a crash earlier. It appears that is reopened. We see traffic flowing there, so we'll double check that coming up. Steve, Myra. Thanks, Sam. All right, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that was winter, I, I guess Thursday is spring. <laughs> yep. Now, yeah. Or it and you have some concerns for Saturday. I don't want to skip Friday, but I mean, I know you have some concerns of what the mix could be on Saturday. Yeah, that's when things will really change again. Cold front comes through early, early Saturday before the sun comes up, essentially for all of us. And it's going to uh, usher in really strong north winds. Pair that with very dry air and some dry vegetation out there. Our ground is very dry and we're looking at a concern for some fire danger on Saturday. We will get into that. Temperatures are already starting to tumble pretty quickly this evening. We're down 10 degrees from our afternoon high. 68 in Hondo, some upper 50s popping up across the hill country. Expect another big swing in temperatures tomorrow, so tomorrow will be another day to dress in layers. You'll want the short sleeves in the afternoon. We're looking at highs back near 80, but early in the day we will start off closer to 40 degrees, so a light jacket or a light sweater will be in order tomorrow morning. Uh, don't get too used to the springtime warmth, though, because after tomorrow things get cooler this weekend. Our afternoon highs will be in the upper 50s Saturday and Sunday behind that cold front that will move on through in a hurry. Weather is really quiet all across Texas, actually really comfortable across the Lone Star State 61 in Lubbock. 68 in Dallas. It's been a beautiful day all across Texas. Next storm system that brings us our cold front and some winter weather to parts of the deep south this weekend is up in the Pacific Northwest and it will be on the move starting tomorrow into the weekend. It's going to uh, drop down to the southeast with a lot of winter weather and precip for parts of eastern Kansas there, the St. Louis area. Notice the front though. We are a bit too far south to really tap into any precip. So this cold front We'll move through without any rain by mid morning Saturday. It is clearing the area and that's when the wind will kick in for us. But I want to show you quickly here. Uh, this storm system will barrel across the deep south Saturday into Sunday and bring a, a mess of some winter weather there. So a complex forecast for parts of the deep south for us. The focus really will be on very windy conditions on Saturday. So here's 6 a.m. Front is already through. Winds will be gusting up to 45 50 miles per hour during the first part of the day on Saturday. So I do think we'll register our highest wind gust Saturday in the morning through about lunchtime and then they'll start to drop a bit in the afternoon, but just plan on it being windy all day on Saturday. Again, wind gusts should likely peak around 45 50 miles per hour. Pair that with very, very dry air, relative humidity values dropping down to near 20% Saturday. That the gusty winds, that's a setup for some fire danger. Essentially any open flame is going to be able to spread very easily with this dry air and gusty wind. So outdoor burning of any kind is highly discouraged. I, I don't know what's more than highly discouraged, but just don't do it. We've got really good conditions for uh, any wildfires to start and spread easily on Saturday. Along with the dry air and gusty winds, our ground is very dry. We've not had a lot of rain over the past few months. Next half hour, I'll show you the latest drought monitor that was issued today, and that will kind of give you a perspective of just how dry our ground and our vegetation is. That also plays a role in the fire danger for Saturday. So that's the weekend tomorrow. Another cool start warming up to almost 80 in the afternoon. And then front comes through early, early Saturday, gusty and colder upper 50s for your high Saturday, Sunday, a light freeze, possible Sunday morning, guys. All right, some things to keep track of there, Katie. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, remember, Larry, when we said, you know, there's no such thing as a sure win yeah. for the Spurs this year? <laughs>
Last night was proof of that. Yeah, and they got two guys back in uh, Kelvin and Devin, so you really had to like the Spurs' chances, and it just didn't work out. So, Kelvin and Devin are back, and Kelvin was telling us what life was like in Boston during quarantine. Plus, Wagner freshman L.A. Sneed dropped 50 points in a district game. Coming up. Yeah, if we won, it would have been better, but I was frustrated about the loss because I fouled out. Wagner's L.A. Sneed is a team first player. She had a 50-point double-double, which is cool, but she'd rather win games in big board sports. Unfortunately, the Spurs lost to the Rockets 128 to 124 last night, but San Antonio got some bodies back, and that's a good thing. Kelvin Johnson and Devin Vassell both returned from health and safety protocols after they each missed a total of six days and three games. Last night, both guys came off the bench. Kelvin scored 18 points in 24 minutes. Vassell had 12 points in 22 minutes. Kelvin said he was stuck in a hotel room in Boston and had to COVID test every day. He stayed in shape by doing band workouts, and as you can imagine, he wasn't pleased with missing game action. Definitely, you know, uh, I mean, it just, it kind of frustrated, you know, we uh, had a big win in Boston, you know, and then, uh, you know, me, Derek, you know, Devin, that we all go down with COVID, kind of, you know, it was, it was definitely frustrating at times, because, uh, you know, I definitely want to be there for my teammates, I feel like uh, we was just getting our momentum back, we just got DJ back, you know, and then we all go down, so that, that sucked. But, you know, I mean, it's just looking forward now. You know, we just got to keep grinding, you know, on to the next game. Got to get a win. Point guard DeJounte Murray led the Spurs last night with his seventh triple-double this season. A career high of 32 points, 10 rebounds, and 11 assists. Plus, he had zero turnovers. So the Spurs will host the Cleveland Cavaliers tomorrow night at 730. This morning, we stopped by Wagner High School to catch up with the girls' basketball team, led by head coach Anissa Jackson, who's now in her fourth season at Wagner. The Thunderbirds are 14-9 overall and 5-1 and in District 27-6A, a tough district with teams like Judson Steele and Clemens, to name a few. And Wagner played a brutal non-district schedule facing squads like Cedar Park and Clark. Our season has uh, definitely been a good one. We're definitely not where we want to be, but we're definitely getting into the right direction. I think it's going good. Um, we're way better than last year. Yeah, and we just have more talent on the team. I feel like our preseason definitely got us ready for district, and um, we just need to continue to get better to reach our goals. On January 4th, freshman guard L.A. Sneed had a 50-point double-double against Steele. This three-pointer sent the game to overtime tied at 75. Sneed had 50 points, 12 rebounds, and five steals. Wagner lost 82-81, which really bummed her out. On top of that, she's the first Thunderbird to top 50 points, girls or boys, in Wagner's rich basketball history. Everything felt good because I know I work on this stuff every day. So it just felt like, like the moment happened and I knew it was going in. So I wasn't really nervous about anything that was going on, no pressure or anything. To be honest, I didn't even know I had that many points. I thought I only had like 30. She was in the zone for sure. She made just one of three ball and went 22 for 27 from the free throw line, an old fashioned 50 piece. Coach Jackson, LA's mom and head coach said LA works very hard. And that hard work is paying off. That's something. The first basketball player, period, to score 50 it, points at Wagner. Yes, history. it totally blew my mind because they've had some good players yeah, come through that program. She thought she only scored 30. I know. Only 30. <laughs> only, yeah, you know? just 30. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> She is an infectious disease specialist, and she has been invaluable to us as we've been going through COVID since, you know, March of 2020. We are talking about Dr. Ruth Bergeron with UT Health San Antonio and the Long School of Medicine there. Uh, Dr. Bergeron, thank you for joining us. Yesterday, we had a record number since the pandemic began of cases, more than 7,000 cases reported by Metro Health yesterday. Should that be put in perspective, though, when we're talking about uh, the Omicron variant and just how contagious it is? Right. Well, um, it's not surprising given what we've seen around the world about the infectiousness of Omicron. 
And remember that even though these numbers are just sky high and, and rising, we're not seeing the same degree of hospitalization from Omicron than we had before. We are still seeing full hospitals, but we're not seeing the devastating impact um, on mortality that we had seen uh, with the Delta variant. Now, how long is this going to go on? That's what people probably really want to know. Yeah. And the answer to that is it depends on whose model you look at. If you go to the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, um, which is a commonly cited source, they think that Texas cases peaked uh, around January 4th uh, and are starting to come down. But if you look at our local data, we're still increasing on a regular basis, and it doesn't look like we're going to plateau out um, until towards the end of January. A lot of talk about masks right now, especially with Omicron being so transmissible. There's the concern that you have to have the N95 or the KN95, that the cloth ones that so many people use don't do the trick. So what do we need to know about that step in protection? Right. So don't be scared if you don't have a KN95. I see you're showing a picture of one right there. Those are a little better than a surgical mask, and a surgical mask is definitely better than a cloth mask. So don't get too hung up on details. Generally speaking, if you can get an N95 or a KN95, that's ideal. If you can't get them, wear a surgical mask. Do not rely on a cloth mask because they are just not as effective as these other masks. And in the setting of a highly transmissible variant, you don't want to rely on a cloth mask. Some people may choose to put a cloth mask over their surgical mask to get a better fit around the face, and that's not a bad idea either. It, that's what I wanted to ask. Is doubling up on a surgical mask or two cloth masks, if that's what you have, because we've seen prices really increasing, <clears throat> especially for the N95 masks, is doubling up effective? Um, possibly. Uh, two cloth masks, I can't really say, are going to be all that great. Um, ideally, you want a surgical mask, and if you want to maybe improve that a little bit, put a cloth mask over it. Again, mainly because you're going to close those gaps around the size of the face. Uh, obviously, with the numbers that we've been seeing lately, likely some most people out there know somebody who has got COVID. The question is, when should you go to the ER, and what should you do if you get it? Okay, thanks for asking that question. So if you have symptoms that don't seem life-threatening, such as headache, fever, fatigue, some cough, loss of smell or taste, if your symptoms don't seem life-threatening, a reasonable thing to do is to call a doctor or primary care provider and discuss your symptoms. You will be told to stay home, don't go to work or school, wear a mask and stay away from other people, including in your own household, and that you should do this for at least five days. On the other hand, if you are experiencing some warning signs that you may have severe COVID-19, you need to seek help immediately. And what are those serious warning signs that you need to look for? They are uh, new or out of the ordinary chest pain or shortness of breath, inability to keep down fluids due to vomiting, or an altered consciousness, a change in mental status, which would be confusion or extreme fatigue, extreme lethargy. Those would be reasons why you should uh, go to the emergency room. Now, if you don't have them, you can check your oxygen level and you can use something called a pulse oximeter. Ideally, check your pulse oximeter reading twice a day or so, and a normal reading is 94% or higher. If your oxygen level shows lower than 94% for more than a few minutes, and that's new for you, that's another warning sign that you should go to the emergency room. You know, one bright spot, I think, for a lot of people in this surge, people take comfort in hearing that Omicron generally does not have as serious symptoms as we saw with Delta. So I know we have both heard conversations about, well, what's the big deal if you get exposed to Omicron? What's the big deal if you are around somebody who has it? What's your response to that? 
Well, I have a lot of different re responses, but first off, I'm hearing about a lot of uh, cases of Omicron and they're no fun. I, I'm hearing about a lot of very severe headaches and people are kind of knocked out and, and in bed for several days. So it's not especially fun and it's not mild. Next, there's the possibility that you'll have long haul COVID from your Omicron experience. And a lot of people do complain about fatigue that's ongoing and brain fog. That's a really common complaint that I hear. So who wants that? And now I wanna to get to the crux of the matter which is, well, two cruxes. One is there's vulnerable people in our community for whom it would be a big deal. Think about the children under the age of five that can't get vaccinated right now. By the way, we're seeing our hospitals begin to have more and more children, including in the pediatric intensive care units, one-year-olds who are very vulnerable. Mm. So that's a reason why other people should care about not getting Omicron because you need to interrupt the chain of transmission and not spread it to vulnerable people. And the second piece that I wanted to come to, or the final piece, is look what it's doing to the stress on the healthcare system. So healthcare workers are also getting Omicron, and when they're sick, they can't go to work, and that means healthcare worker shortages, which means fewer people available to take care of you when you get sick. I wanna talk about what's going on at Pittman Sullivan Park uh, next Monday. MLK Day. Uh, obviously, the march has been canceled, but there's still something going on there. Talk about it. Uh, we've got a graphic up right now. Yes, that's right. Um, the city of San Antonio Metro Health, uh, in collaboration with UT Health Science Center, uh, will be there at Pittman Sullivan Park from 10 to 3. We will be giving out free vaccines. Um, so you can get your first, second, third dose or your booster dose. Um, and vaccines are available for basically five years and up at this point in time. There will also be COVID-19 testing. So come on out and see us, get vaccinated, but mask up and wash your hands. I'm sure we'll have those details on our website at ksat.com as well. Dr. Bergren, always appreciate your perspective and your answers. Thanks for being here. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Just some uh, reminders about uh, construction here. Uh, Loop 1604 alternating lane closure between I-10 and Bandera Road kicks off at 9 p.m. through January 15th. Part of that big project, I'm sure that'll be extended and the graphic will have to be updated, but I'll do that tomorrow. Anyway, uh, Loop 1604 on the north side, also some alternating lane closures here. Also road work on Blanco Road and Loop 1604 live in that area keep that in mind already seeing some delays in that area this evening uh, with the construction project going on also some delays on loop 410 on the uh, north side heading toward i-35 15 minutes now from 281 uh, to i-35 only five minutes the other way so let's take a look at what's going on there this is a crash here hopefully this gets cleared up soon but this is the view from loop 410 at austin highway also a rollover reported on 1604 and calabria so Pretty busy evening out there, guys. Thanks, Sam. Let's take a look outside with live cam. We enjoyed a beautiful day today as we head towards some big changes this weekend, Katie. Oh, yes. Uh, enjoy this evening. It's going to be really comfortable out there. Temperatures are falling through the 60s now. We'll be all the way down to near 40 to start the day on Friday and more spring-like warmth tomorrow afternoon before our next cold front gets here early on Saturday. So really comfortable out at the airport now, temperature of 67. So dress in layers again tomorrow, because it'll get warm again tomorrow afternoon, turning colder and windy this weekend. That sets us up for some fire danger on Saturday. I'll walk you through that setup coming up in just a few minutes. All right, beautiful day today, but we are not off the weather roller coaster yet. Nope. Never really are. No. <laughs> Until we get to that South stretch Texas. in the summer where it's just hot for three weeks. Yeah. That's when the roller coaster starts. That's when we want the bit. roller coaster to start. <laughs> right, exactly. Otherwise, uh, we usually always busy here in the Weather Center, and we do have our next big set of changes coming up 
this weekend. So we finish out the work week tomorrow warm again in the afternoon, but our afternoon highs will drop into the upper 50s this weekend behind a front that moves through very, very early on Saturday. Also very windy conditions expected on Saturday behind this frontal passage. So last half hour we talked a bit about the fire danger setup for Saturday. This is behind the cold front. Gusty winds kick in. Humidity is going to be very, very low. We've also got some very dry earth out there, especially uh, dormant vegetation and things like that. So this was just released this evening by the Texas A&M Forest Service, and it basically just gives you a look at the fire danger rating for Saturday. Notice most of the area, especially along and west of 35, is at a very high fire danger rating for Saturday. So. Essentially everyone is discouraged from doing outdoor burning of any kind this weekend, particularly on Saturday, but I would say into Sunday as well because it will still be breezy. Again, fire danger conditions really set up when we've got strong winds. We'll have that in place Saturday. Check very low humidity. Relative humidity will be generally around or less than 20% by Saturday as an even drier air mass moves in. And again, dry soils and vegetation, um, that's where the drought monitor comes into play. So I'm gonna step off screen quickly so you can get the big picture here. Three months ago, 15% of the state of Texas was in some sort of drought. As of today, now 82% of the state of Texas is in some sort of drought. So not just here at home, but also elsewhere across the state. Drought is starting to become uh, a bit more intense and also widespread. So this is fresh data that came out today. Uh, we've got a pocket of extreme drought there southeast of Eagle Pass, west of Catula, um, a pretty big swath up in the hill country and then down from uh, Maverick County through Catula over to Live Oak County of severe drought. So the earth is very, very dry. Our vegetation is dry, so that also plays into the fire danger risk for Saturday. Our front coming through, no rain with this guy, unfortunately. There could be a couple of showers that try to develop as it gets down a bit closer to the Gulf Coast. This is going to be very, very early on Saturday, so no rain with this front to help us out. And again, after the front passes through, that's when our wind speeds really start to pick up. We're looking at wind gusts up near 45, 50 miles per hour. Starting first thing Saturday morning, essentially all day. I do think we'll see our highest gusts for the day before lunchtime, but even into Saturday afternoon, it is still going to be quite windy. So uh, prepare for that. I was thinking as Samuel was doing traffic, <coughs> those that drive high profile vehicles like 18 wheelers, when wind gusts get that high, starts to get a little bit dicey for high profile vehicles. So that's something to keep in mind for Saturday as well. Around the uh, county currently 64 at Kelly, 73 at Stinson, still in the low to mid 70s in some spots, but with really dry air in place already, our dew points are in the 20s and 30s. Clear skies, light winds, uh, temperatures will fall quickly overnight. Uh, one more note about the dry air. Again, it gets even drier this weekend behind our cold front. We're going to have an extended period of low humidity here all the way heading into the middle part of next week. So with low humidity tomorrow, another big swing in our temperatures, 42 in the morning, up to just shy of 80 in the afternoon. And then the big changes kick in this weekend. We'll be here to keep you updated over the next few days. Make sure you have that KSAT Weather Authority app downloaded and ready to go so we can keep you in the know over the weekend. It is very handy. I thank think so too. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> in case you missed it, coming up next. Good morning to you. It is Thursday, January 13th. Yes, uh, police tell us there are two serious injuries at this point. A man and woman who were the only occupants of this truck. This truck, the only one involved in the crash, happened a little bit before 5.30 this morning. You can see the truck, uh, firefighters, police still checking it out. Uh, they did just have two ambulances take the patients away. Looking at a deadly seven-car crash in Houston, that is a deputy sheriff's car right in the middle of it all. The deputy was chasing an arm 
armed robbery suspect last night. He came up to an intersection with lights flashing, sirens, sirens blaring, but he still ended up crashed into another car as he drove through the intersection. The woman driving that car was killed. There were two children in the car, five and two. They were taken to the hospital, the oldest in critical condition. In the midst of a pandemic and less than a year after many customers were thrown into the dark and cold in the February freeze, the city council raised CPS customers' rates for the first time in eight years. With the utility saying it needed the higher fuel charge to pay for costs related to the freeze and the bump in the base rate for infrastructure, staffing, and technology needs, council voted 9-2 to two and 8-3 to three respectively for the two parts of the increase. The congressional gold medal has been posthumously awarded to Emmett Till and his mother. The U.S. Senate voted this week to honor the mother and son with the highest civilian honor. Till was 14 years old visiting Mississippi when two white men kidnapped and killed him before dumping his body in the Tallahatchie River back in 1955. The men were later acquitted of the murder by an all-white jury. Till's mother chose to have an open casket funeral to show the world the brutal way her son was murdered. <laughs>Oh, the crash on uh, the northeast side at uh, Loop 410 at Perrin Vital near Austin Highway, that has cleared, but we do have a situation here on the uh, west side. Uh, this is Loop 1604 Calabra rollover, uh, seeing some delays there. Here's a look at Transguide 410 at Babcock, Katie, flowing well. Thank you, Samuel. More changes ahead tomorrow. Another warm one, highs near 80. But by Sunday morning, we're looking at our next widespread light freeze behind a cold front that moves through early on Saturday. Very windy Saturday, wind gusts up to 45, 50 miles per hour. Guys. All right. Thank you, Katie. And thank you for watching the news at 6. We'll see you back here on the night beat at 10.